Okay, so I want you to look down at the fourth line. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to read it together slowly because it's that important. It's life-changing. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. Has anybody ever heard that before? So let's say it together. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. All of us go through times when we're not okay. And it can be for a minute, it can be for an hour, it can be for a week, it can be for years. And when you allow that situation, whatever it is, to continue without you working on it, you're going to spiral downwards. And when you spiral downwards, that's when men get in trouble, because quite often they go into isolation, right? So when I saw that saying the first time, I, you know, I was in a period of that, for sure, with lots of different issues. And so the whole reason is to take positive steps to move forward. But you, taking positive steps to move forward is critical. But let's talk about uh, baggage and the different types of baggage. For today's message, we're going to talk about four types. The first is material baggage. Stuff that just adds up, that you've gotten over the years that just adds up. And some of that baggage reminds us of things that aren't so good in our lives. True? But for some reason, we keep it. Now, I'm very personal, I'm very transparent. Um, a couple years ago, my wife said to me, why do you keep these letters from your father at the end of his life? All they were were derogatory towards you. And I said, well, it's all I have. That's all I have of, of his. And she said, well, you should really go ahead and let it go. And I let it go. And I didn't realize till, till later, even though he was not around because he was a workaholic from that World War II generation, you can tell I'm getting pretty personal here. Um, he did the very, very best he could for us. He commuted four hours a day on a train for the family. And so I started to realize at that point that my perception of him had to change. And I had to find the things that were good in him. And um, one of the best things was his military service. And so I went and we found his footlockers from World War II that went over on the Queen Elizabeth for D-Day. He uh, was in the Signal Corps. He trained the Band of Brothers to use the equipment, trained him in the United States. But my point is, we find this stuff, and it, we can either do positive things with it if we've collected it, or we've got to get rid of it. So we have material baggage. Number two, physical illness. We have physical problems. We have illness. We have accidents. We have injuries. We have stress. That's baggage. Now, I'm going to ask a lot of questions today, but you don't need to raise your hands. But how many of us, obviously, have physical Physical baggage, a lot of us do. Emotional relationships, emotional baggage. Relationships, people. Anytime you're dealing with people, you're gonna have baggage. Life occurrences, marriage, divorce, uh, financial problems, kids on drugs, business, business issues. Uh, all kinds of different, different experiences. We'll have emotional baggage from that. And then this one came this week, I was thinking about it, because I talked to quite a few guys this week, and the, the theme was really constant, and it was, they have religious and spiritual baggage from places they felt they weren't treated right at churches or pastors or whatever. And that was really deep, really hurt them a lot. I know we, my wife and I had that problem. But if you think about these, they all connect, and they're all intertwined. For instance, any of these can cause you to have emotional difficulty. You can get upset, which can lead to physical problems, correct? Stress, stress from work, can also cause emotional distress, even though that's physical. So they're all intertwined. I've seen people so sick over church breakups that they had to be hospitalized. So we're carrying lots of baggage. So of these four that I listed here, uh, I think you can find yourself in at least one or more, more of those. So I want to talk to you today, just for the purposes of this, I don't know where this came from, but I want you to think of our lives as a, as a truck, a truck, T-R-U-C-K. And it can be a big semi-tractor trailer that's totally empty, or a big U-Haul 23-footer that's empty, or a big open truck. And when we're born, it, unless we have some physical problems, that truck is empty of all this kind of baggage, correct? So as we go down the road of life, what happens to that truck? It starts to get full of different stuff, stuff, different types of baggage. And the key, I believe, is as we move through life to learn how to deal with this baggage so when we get to the end of life, we have peace and we have balance. And um, life doesn't have to be just full of baggage.
Okay? So, today we're going to talk about how to be a champion for Christ, and that comes back to our priorities. A lot of you guys are new. Our priorities are one of our signature topics we use. We, our signature video on the Iron Sharpens Iron Phoenix YouTube site is about putting God first. So it's all about balance, because if your life is not in balance and your priorities aren't straight, you're going to have a life that's chaotic, it's going to be toxic, and it's going to be the opposite of peace. I can promise you that. For the guys that think that God doesn't have to be first, you know, out of love I say to you, you're absolutely wrong. And I learned that the hard way. The signature, uh, uh, excuse me, scripture for today is Matthew 6.33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. John MacArthur said, what did Jesus mean when he said we are to seek God's kingdom first? It means our top priority in life should be to seek what is eternal. Think about that. So in this scripture, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Look what's up at the front. First. First. You don't need to look any further for the rest of your life. You have to seek God first. And a lot of you guys know that it took me a long time to have God finally be, you know, number one in my life for me to be all in. I'm totally all in. And being all in, I got to tell you, especially for a type A guy, was the most liberating thing I ever did in my life because it didn't all matter, man. It wasn't about me anymore. And my needs didn't, weren't that important anymore. It's about other people. So that scripture really was life-changing for me. So I'm going to go through the, the uh, seven areas real quick that's on that video I talked about putting God first. So we know God has to be first, prioritizing your pursuit of Jesus. Number two is health. Now why do we say health is second? Uh, people write in and ask this all the time. If you don't have your health, guys, I'll make it easy for you. The body tells us, or excuse me, the Lord tells us our body's a temple, right? And he gave us these amazing bodies to do things. I believe that we're here to serve and do things for him. If you don't have your health, you can't do anything else really, really well that's down on that list. If you look at it, you're not going to be able to provide right for your family, the material necessities, work, volunteering. You can't even worship or maybe go serve a church like you really want to. Uh, health is absolutely critical. In January, we do our annual fitness. Uh, we talk about that, so I'm going to leave it till then. Next, family and personal relationships, number three. The Bible says in Genesis, it is not good for man to be alone. And God brought, obviously, woman to man, and then um, community. And that's what started Art Sharpens Iron. Men need to be in fellowship. Men need to be in community. Men need somebody they can talk to. And um, so that's why family and personal relationships are so important. Number four speaks for itself, material necessities, food and water, clothing and shelter. Without any of those, you're going to die. It's real, real simple. Number five, work and or volunteering. Sometimes that's interchangeable with number four because most people have to work in order to provide for their material necessities of life. Number six, material stuff. Let's talk about this because the only difference between men and boys, the expression says, is the price of their toys. I believe that if your priorities are correct, I think it's great to have the, the things you've worked hard for. If you want boats, cars, planes, guitars, paintings, whatever it is, I think that's great. But you have to clarify your view on stuff. Don't treasure tre treasures. And if money defines you, it will destroy you. I love when the Bible tells us it's the love of money that's destructive, not money itself. A gentleman named John Mark Comer said, for a lot of people, things aren't just things, they are identities. Because more stuff can lead to more stress because your mind becomes distracted rather than focused. So watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Has anybody found that to be true? Oh, if I just had the Corvette that, you know, my neighbor has, then I'd be happy. It doesn't work. First seek God. And that's where the peace comes from. Number seven, it's my least favorite to talk about, but I have to. If statistics hold true, at least 60% of us in here are addicted to pornography. And we're fortunate that we have an absolutely fantastic ministry that deals with that. Patrick and Skip, would you guys stand up for me, please? There they are. Let's give these guys a round of applause for what they do. Thank you, guys. So see them if you'd like to get involved. They have great success, and they actually have a wives group for wives of the guys who are involved in pornography, which is fantastic. But let's talk about some other addictions. Uh, mine, as I explained on that video, was work. 
and work caused me to get really, really sick 30 years ago, from which I've never recovered, really. But that's how important addictions are and they can mess you up. What are some other addictions? Just call them out for me. Alcohol. Alcohol. What else? Media. Excuse me? Media. Media. Okay, that's really good. Yeah, thank you. What else? Food. food. Who has a food problem? Yeah. I'm on the seafood diet. I see it and I eat it. You ever hear that one? Drugs. Drugs. Right. What else? Sports. Sports, shopping, all kinds of addictions. So you have to ask yourself, are your priorities in order on that list and what needs to be rearranged? You have to be honest with yourself. What do you need to remove from your life and reorganize your priorities so Jesus is at the top? Tough question if you're going to be all in. You know, we've given this out a lot at other meetings, and I can tell you that for most, the top three, God, health, and family, are usually halfway down or near the bottom, if men are being honest. Work and addictions are at the top, and health just falls in near the bottom. So today, when we get into our small groups, I'm going to ask you to be wholly transparent. I have men tell me all the time, I love this, that the only place in their life they can be totally transparent is coming to Iron Sharpens Iron because no one's going to judge them. They feel if they're totally transparent at work, they won't get a promotion or nobody will like them. They can't be transparent at church because everybody looks great at church, right? Everybody's got the big smile on. They can't be open with their golf buddies because then they might get kicked out of the golf group. So to establish and stick to getting your priorities straight with God first, always takes courage. Our friend Don Reisdorf who spoke last week posted this in his devotion last night that many of you received. The key point is this, we are courageous when it is more about him and less about our plans and our presumption that we are taking care of our own needs. In summary, we will be courageous men and we will have acts of courage, faith, and trust when we don't let fear paralyze us. When we place ourselves in a position of dependency on God, and when our mind is stayed on God. These things will bring us his blessings and his perfect peace. So fellas, the baggage and issues of life that have plagued you, I promise, if you follow the priorities, will lessen and almost often disappear. You walk out of the door with those priorities and say, this is what I'm gonna do, it's almost instantaneous. The people around you, your family, your work, they'll see a change in you, there's no doubt about it. But you have to take the step. Am I really going to put God first? Now we're going to go to number two after priorities, and that's surrender and submission. It's amazing how many of these things came up in our Bible study this week, Matthew 26. The main difference between submission and surrender is that submission may not always involve acceptance of someone's authority, whereas surrender usually involves willingly yielding to someone's authority. They're pretty closely related, though. I was thinking about a good example for submission this week, and I was thinking of MMA fighters. They get, someone puts them in a hold, they can't get out, so they tap out. They have to submit. But did they really surrender to that whole thing? No way. They still probably think they're a part of the expression, a badass, and all this other stuff. The fact is, surrender is surrendering unto God, as we said in the Bible study this week, every minute of every day. And that's what it is. But you have to decide if you're going to surrender. I love Revelation 3.20 when the Lord says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. He's standing there waiting. So the question for number two is, have you surrendered and are you all in in your life yet? And if you're not, you've got a ton of guys around you that are willing to help you. One thing I will tell you is I'm very excited also, in addition to all the great ministries we have, sub-ministries, um, Steve Coulter, our friend, is going to be speaking about discipleship and the importance of being discipled. And we have several guys now that have stepped up and volunteered to disciple people. And that's going to start in the spring. So think about that. It's really, really important to help understand, if you need to, about surrender. We also recently uh, tied into a, a great group for grief counseling and PTSD. So if you know anybody who has those issues, talk to one of the guys with the red tag and we'll get you hooked up. Number three, obedience to God's will and his word. The distinct definition of Bible obedience is to hear God's word and act accordingly. Thus, biblical obedience to God means to hear, 
trust, submit, and surrender to God and his word. You know, people always ask me, how do I get into God's will? And I heard a message once that said two of the ways are, number one, you have to be in his word. And number two, hang around with other godly men, perhaps that know more about the Bible than you do. Those are two ways. Think of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, not my will. So if you want to know what God's will is for your life, you've got to put him first. And that involves his word. So question number three, are you obedient to God's word or are you just picking and choosing? How many of us don't want to follow certain things in the Bible? Ah, uh, you know, that's for old times. It's not for now, they say. The Bible's a living document. It's the truth. Amen. It's the truth. Number four, extremely important, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being spirit-filled is centered upon a continual process of spiritual growth and maturity that can only be found and cultivated by the Spirit of God. But by submitting this process, we glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in word and deed while being conformed to his image through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within and filling us continually. I believe we need to ask every day for that filling of the Holy Spirit. That's just how I feel about it. And of course, Galatians 5, and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law now imagine this let's say for the entire day tomorrow everybody in the world exhibited the fruit of the holy spirit what an amazing world it would be conflicting contrasting with that imagine if there was no holy spirit at all which is going to happen what a disastrous world it will be these are the kind of the fruit of the holy spirit is things we should have in every transaction we do whether we're the, in, in person or in business, if you carry this in your heart and you pray for the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you will be a changed person in addition to what we talked about already, the priorities. So, question, do you ask the Lord continually to give you a fresh indwelling of the Holy Spirit and are you living your life by the fruit of the Spirit? Things like anger, things like that, they're going to get you nowhere. Number five, and I like this one, we've talked about it a lot, dropping your pride. None of you guys have pride issues, right? Right. I used to have a lot of pride issues. And the Bible warns again and again about pride. It says, let others praise you and not your own lips. Don't be, have a haughty spirit. Approach friends with vulnerability by being honest, apologizing, and asking for help. Approach God with humility by looking to the Bible for comfort, praying for what's on your heart, and asking God for real answers to real issues. We need to make life about loving others, guys, and not ourselves. Second greatest commandment, love your neighbor. Think of others more highly than you think of yourself from Scripture. And I say look in the mirror every day when you get ready to go to bed and you're brushing your teeth there and say, how did I do my priorities today? Are they in order? If not, what do I have to fix tomorrow? Do I have to put my family higher on the list? And do a pride check when you look in the mirror. How's my pride? I tell my kids, don't be like me. Be like Jesus. Because... Man's always going to disappoint you, you've heard that, but Jesus will never disappoint you. So, um, I want to read one scripture as I close here today. And I was sitting with one of the men after Bible study Tuesday, and he said, I want, can I tell you my, my life verse? And he, he said it, and I said, that's interesting, because that's exactly what I was planning to close with this week. I mean, God is just so amazing. It does. So I'm going to read it from two versions, one from the Message Bible, and another from the NIV. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Are you tired and worn out, burned out on religion? Now, these are the things I've talked about with the baggage. Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. The baggage won't weigh you down. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So in review, guys, because I always believe in coming back and telling you what I've told you, get your priorities in proper order and be courageous about it. 
surrender your life to God, be obedient to his will and his word, seek continually the Holy Spirit and drop your pride.